again, I pray that today is a blessed day for all of you fathers. Um, and as we go through this, this lesson this morning, I work very hard. I, now, I'm talking to fathers specifically, okay? But, but I, I work very hard to make this lesson very applicable to everyone, okay? So, so if you're going through this lesson and, and you just hear fathers this, fathers that, um, I, I want you to internalize what the message really is to you, okay? Uh, I, I shared last year, by the way, a year ago today, well, a year ago, fa Father's Day last year, I, I was interviewing for this position here. Uh, and I shared in that, that message last year that my father, my dad, left my mother, my sister, and myself when I was three years old. And uh, the blessing through that, I guess, if there is a blessing, is that, that I really didn't understand what was going on. Because I was so young and, and I wasn't overly attached to my dad. Um, but I, I didn't quite understand what was going on. But the, the downside to that is I really didn't understand what was going on. Okay? Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't know the situation, what was, what was happening. And so it was very difficult as a child to, to be going through that. But I remember one time when I was seven years old, uh, the, the best memory that I have with my dad. It was January 22nd, 1984. Uh, I was seven years old, and my, my dad was a tool pusher out on a drilling rig. Uh, basically, his job was to sit in an air-conditioned trailer house and wait till if they, if they had any problems out on the rig, they'd come get my dad, and, and he'd kind of walk them through it. But I went out to visit my dad on January 22nd, 1984. It was a Sunday. It happened to be Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, it, was, it was a Super Bowl where uh, the Washington Redskins played the Oakland Raiders, okay? Um, and so, so I go out there to watch the Super Bowl with my dad, and, and he wants to, to put a bet on the game, okay? And he, he, he let me choose the team that I wanted to choose, who I, wanted, who I thought was going to win, and I chose the Washington Redskins. And, and for the life of me, right now, I cannot figure out why in the world I picked the Washington Redskins. I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan, okay? Redskins and Cowboys don't mix, okay? But I picked the Washington Redskins. And so our bet was a dollar for every touchdown and 50 cents for every field goal. Okay, I'm seven years old. I, I mean, I wasn't, I didn't have, wasn't carrying around a lot of cash. And so, so... Um, we go through the game, and if you will remember the, the game, it, it was the Oakland Raiders just dominated. The, the final score was 38 to 9. Man, I, I lost $4.50. That's 450 pennies, okay, that I lost to my dad. And I was so frustrated going through that game because I was writing IOU after IOU because I didn't have any money. But I, I, I enjoyed, so much enjoyed that time with my dad. And, and as I mentioned, that, that was, that was the, the best memory that I have with my dad. But I remember that day thinking, man, I want to be like my dad. My, my, my dad was a, was a tool pusher. He was the man out on location on a rig. And, and I wanted to be like my dad. I wanted to grow up and, and be a tool pusher. I wanted to work out in the oil field. Uh, thankfully, I, I got older and wiser, and I began to understand what happened when I was three years old. Okay? But what that, that moment taught me as I look back is that we as fathers have such an impression on our young children. And, and because I was seven years old and, and I, I was thinking, man, I really want to be like my dad. And now I see my son growing up and his eyes are on me watching every move that I make. And I know that my son, even at, at, at 14 years old, is thinking in some way he wants to be like me. And, and for me to, to come to that realization, to that understanding, is pretty overwhelming as a father. It gives me 
an awesome responsibility for my kids. And so this morning, I want to look at our Heavenly Father as the ultimate example of what a father should be. And I, I want to look at three characteristics that, that our Father in Heaven has, and, and He has many other characteristics, but these are three characteristics that I think are very important for us as dads, as fathers, and parents to our children. Okay? Um, the first thing that I, I want to look at, and, and we talked about it several weeks ago, is God's love. In 1 John chapter 4, in verse 7, John says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Now, not, not God loves. God does love. But God is love. Okay, that, that's God's very, that's his character. God's very character is God, is, is love. That means there, there cannot, there's no possibility for hate to be in God because God is love. It's his very character. The love that God has, and we talked about it several weeks ago, is unconditional doesn't matter what we say, what we do, the way we act. We can do nothing that is going to make God love us any less than what he loves us right now. Because his love is unconditional. It's without any condition. God loves his children. And he will always love his children unconditionally. And so as fathers, we should exhibit the characteristic of love to our children. Nothing that they say, nothing that they do, no way that they act should ever stop us from loving them because they are our children. And unfortunately, I, I think, and in, in, in maybe in this group right here, we do have that kind of love for our children. We do love our children unconditionally so much that, that we would do anything for our children. But unfortunately, and there, there may be some in here that grew up without their father's love. I did. I, I grew up without, without my father's love. I remember my, my birthday is February the 20th. My sister's birthday is February the 11th. We would always get a call about February 16th or 17th so that my dad could tell us both happy birthday at the same time. That way he didn't have to call twice. It's not, that's not love. And so we have to look to our Father in heaven to see the, 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 the example of love, to see that characteristic. And we have to have that same characteristic for our children. As we're raising our children up, we have to show our children the character of of love. And we have to show them so much so that our children know nothing from us but love. That when they think of, of dad, they think of a lo loving father, a father that loves me. That's the example that we have to set for our children. Paul tells us in, in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, he says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Exasperating our children is not love. It's to antagonize. And that is certainly not love. To annoy our children is not loving. And so we have to, to exhibit that characteristic of love to our children. And we, that love has to be unconditional. Nothing that they can say, do, any way that they can act that is going to make us love them less than what we love them now. And our children should never feel like they have to do something special in order to get some love from their father. They shouldn't. And if, and if you do, 
If, if your children have to do something special to get attention, to get, to get affection from you, to get love from you, you need to re-examine yourself so that you exhibit the characteristic of love. And it's because God exhibits, the, because God is love, because his very, very character is love, that he is a disciplinarian. It's because of God's love for his children that he is a disciplinarian. Hebrews says this, he said, the writer of Hebrews says, in your struggle against sin, you have not, resist, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the ones he loves. And he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. So endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children for what children are not disciplined by their father. And so, so our father is a loving father. Our God is love. And we should exhibit that same love, but our father is also a disciplinarian. That's one of his characteristics is being a disciplinarian. And it's because of his love for us that he disciplines us. If he didn't love us, we wouldn't, we wouldn't receive discipline. We have to have discipline. And God knows that because God loves us. Sometimes when we have hardships, that is our discipline from our Father. We talked about it last week when we, we talked about going through storms in our lives. Sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes those storms in our life are dis, is discipline for us. You know, we make bad decisions. We put ourselves in bad situations, and, and, and we have to go through those storms, and those storms become discipline. Why? What happens when we go through a storm and we realize what got us there? Are we going to do it again? Likely that we're not going to do it again. That's our discipline. That's our discipline because when we, when we learn from our mistakes... We don't make those same mistakes twice. If we make them twice, hopefully you're not going to make them a third time. Okay? If, you, if you do that, then, then that's, that's considered insane. Okay? That's insanity. Okay? God disciplines his children. And we gain wisdom through that discipline. We know what not, what not to do, and we stop making those mistakes. And those are the consequences that we have to pay for making bad decisions. And so as fathers, we have to be disciplinarians. We have to discipline our children. I remember as a, as a child, I was raised by my mother, and, and my mother, she, she would discipline us with a belt. And, and I remember she would, she would get that belt out, and she would tell me, she would look me straight in the eye, and she would say, this is going to hurt me worse than it hurts you. And as a kid, I thought, yeah, right, you're the one there. You have the belt in your hand, and you're fixing to lay that sucker right across my rear end. That is not going to feel good. That's going to hurt me worse than it hurts you. But as a parent now, as a father, I understand exactly what she was saying. Because when, when, when I've had to, to discipline my children, even time out, is difficult. Um, and, and, and I've had, you know, as my kids have gotten older, I've, I've had to use uh, the belt to get their attention, to discipline them. I, I remember when, when they were younger, and I would swat them with my hand, especially Christian. Rick Christian is rock hard. And that, that would, I, I, I really believe that literally hurt me worse than it hurt him. <laughs> and so that, that's why I had to resort to the belt. But to see them in pain and, and broken it's difficult for a parent to see that but the blessing from that even after time out my kids would come and sit on my lap give me a hug and tell me I'm sorry they understood what the discipline did 
They, need, they knew that they needed to be disciplined. And that was a good thing. And so as fathers, we have to discipline our children. That, that's part of training our children, raising our children up. Uh, Solomon tells us in Proverbs, he says, start children off on the way they should go. And even when they are old, they will not turn from it. That is, that is how we train our children. We train them from the beginning. And, and we use that discipline from the beginning so that when they grow old, they won't, they won't depart from that training. They'll always come back to what they know because you have disciplined your children, because you love your children. Although God loves his children, he uses discipline. But the reason why he can do that is because he is always with us. Matthew, we read this. He says, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. You see, God has always been with his people Joshua chapter 1 and verse 5, he says, No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's a promise from our Creator. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And as we look in the Old Testament, we look from, from Genesis to Malachi, we see God in there. And we see that God was with his people when, when they were out in the desert for 40 years. God was with his people through the, the, the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud. God was leading his people. God was with his people. And then we come into the New Testament. And, and we see right here in Matthew chapter 1 that God is still with his people in the form of Jesus Christ. And so God came in the flesh. And we, we know in, in, in John chapter 1 and verse 1, where it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we see that in, in verse 14 of that same chapter, it says, The Word became flesh. Jesus became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the one Father, full of grace and truth. You see, God was with his people in the Old Testament. And he came in the flesh, in, in the very body of Jesus Christ, to be with his people. Remember, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. There was a period of time that people thought God was not there. But he showed up in the form of Jesus Christ. And he gave his one and only son to be with us. And so for three and a half years, Jesus dwelt among his people, healing people, casting out demons. For three and a half years, he was with his closest friends, teaching them to be like him. Jesus did that. Jesus was among his people. But not only is Jesus, is God with us through Jesus, but now, God is with us through his Holy Spirit, who he has given to us. John chapter 16 and verse 7 says, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus says that, you know what, it is better for you that I leave. Because, because the advocate, the Spirit of God, is going to come in and he's going to dwell among you, but more importantly, he's going to dwell in you. And Jesus says that that Spirit is better than himself in the flesh. And I know it's hard for us, difficult for us, to wrap our minds around that because how many times have you even thought yourself, Man, if, if Jesus was here in the flesh, this would be so much easier. But Jesus says, no, you've got something better. You have the Spirit of God living in you. And that is far better than me. And so God right now is dwelling 
among his people. He is with his people right now. And so as fathers, we must always be there for our children. We should never be away. Our kids ought to know that they can call on dad anytime. You may, you may be halfway across the country, but they know that you're just a phone call away or a text away and be able to, to call on you and have that time with their father, with their dad. They have to know that you're always going to be with them. Just like our Father in heaven is among us and dwelling among us, we must be dwelling among our children. We must always teach them to be like Jesus. Deuteronomy chapter 6, probably one of the most important Bible passages that we have written for us. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. So we're to have those commandments on our hearts. But look what he says next. He says, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Men, fathers, this is for us. Parents, this is for us. God says you are to put these commands on your hearts. But not only on your hearts, but you are to impress them on your children. We're supposed to talk about these things everywhere we go, everything that we do. Those are for us to impress on our children and to give to our children, to pass along to our children. Our children should always know that we are there, that we'll never leave them, that we're always going to be there for them. They've got to know that. We have comfort in knowing that God has sent his son. And then he has sent his spirit to dwell in us. We have that comfort of knowing that our children have to have that same comfort of knowing that we're there for them. So maybe this morning you're here and you're saying, I understand what you said at the beginning, that we need to internalize this and we need to apply it to ourselves. But that, that would have been really applicable to me 20 years ago when I had kids at home. Well, I want to challenge you this morning that you take this and apply it to your lives right now. You can still do these things with your children, even though they are 62 years old. You can still do this with your children. Talk to them. You can do it with your grandchildren. More importantly, you can do it with these children that are here. You know, they, they say it takes a village to raise a child. We're the village here. We're a family here. And we always have little eyes looking up to us. No matter how old you are or how young you are, there's always somebody here, unless you're SJ's age, that is looking up to you. I look up to the older men in my life that are here. People that are younger than me are looking at me. And there are young ones looking at them. There's always somebody looking up to you. And so we have to be able to be the examples of a father to them. Just as our father in heaven is the example to us. Maybe you're here this morning and you're kicking yourself because you have failed as a father. I want to tell you this morning, no, you haven't. You have not failed as a father. You have time to turn it around. 
You just, all you have to do is seek him and seek his example. Take these things that, that God has done for us, his love, his discipline, and knowing his comfort, being comforted that he is with us now. And be that example to your children. Maybe you're here this morning and you're just ready to take that step to be the example of a father that God has called you to be. And you're ready to put Christ on in baptism so that you can begin that, 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 that traveling down that road to see him as an example, to be that example to your children. Whatever your need is this morning, we want to offer this as a time for you to come forward as we all stand and as we sing. Just as